Now, rhetorical question here. What's the purpose of life? Big question. Big question. What do people live for? Uh, Rick Warren is a famous author, and he wrote that we live life at one of these three basic levels that I'll put on the screen. Some people live for survival, just to survive, just to get by in life. They are not really living, they are just existing. Some people, they work every day so they can enjoy the weekends. Some people, they don't really have any major goals in life. So those are the people who say they just live for survival. Then there's the people who live for success. Most people actually fall under this category because they are on a level a little higher. Um, they're focusing on paying off their mortgages. They're focused on establishing a comfortable lifestyle as soon as possible. And even though they are achieving goals, they find that this level does not satisfy. Then you have a third category, the people who live for significance. Significance is when you know why you're here. Significance is when you have a purpose for your life, you know that your life matters, you know that there's a meaning behind what is going on in your life. Which one of these three categories do you fall under? What have you been living for? So, personally, I would like to live a life of significance because apparently there's a lot of emptiness in the other two. And research says, science proves that people who have found significance to their lives live more healthily, happily, they're more fulfilled. How do we discover our significance? Some of you mentioned the spiritual component several times you mentioned this because I imagine you have discovered this, that the spiritual component is crucial for you to discover the purpose of your life. In fact, have you heard of the term spiritual health? One of the issues in society is that they have addressed mental health, social health, financial, physical health, but they have not addressed emotional health, it's spiritual health. And spiritual health is what answers questions of significance. And God, He wants us to know our purpose. Before God even planned this world, did you know that He planned you? God had you in His mind before this world came to be. He planned you and He planned your purpose before you were born. And when you fulfill your life's purpose, you're going to find satisfaction in your life. Does God have a purpose? Does, does He live a life of significance? Absolutely. For us to discover what kind of purpose God has, we just need to find out what the Bible says about Him. Open your Bible to 1 John 4, 8. 1 John is towards the end of the Bible, or you can just Google it, 1 John 4, 8. It says, whoever does not love does not know God because God, because God is love. God is love. This text can be perceived, I believe, as the ultimate description of who God is. And the follow and a few verses later, look at verse 19. What does verse 19 say? We love because God loved us first. So not only He is love, He lives to love. Can you understand His purpose? If He is love, He lives to love, we discover, we discover the purpose of God. 
And the Bible also says, we love because he loved us first. So, if God is love, then what are we? Who are we? Why are we here? One key verse in the scriptures is found in Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, it tells us this. God created human beings in his own image. God is love. All right? You and I were made like similar to him, similar to what he is like. What does that mean? Can you tell your group? What does that mean? If we're made similar to what he is like, what does that tell us about us? Can you share with your group? If he is love and we were made in his image, what does that mean? Does that mean that we were also made for love? To love. At least that's the Bible's perspective about who we are. The purpose of your life is to love. Oh, no wonder us humans crave for love, talk of love, sing of love. You know, the, the subject of love in the world, especially romantic love, is so strong. What is it, sister? Huh? Endless. It's endless. It's an endless thirst for love. And the reason is because of the reason of our existence. Love is an essential part of our existence. We're made to be loved by God, to love God, and to love one another. Interesting. When you look at Jesus, you notice that Jesus manifested every one of those aspects of love. He lived to love God. He lived to be loved by God. And he lived to love others. Have you noticed that? That's why Jesus is our best example in the Bible how to live a meaningful life. You look at his life. You look at the way he talked to the others. The way he would process when people were speaking to him. The way that he would respond. The way that he would act. That is a purposeful living example. Without giving or receiving love, we don't fulfill our, or our life's purpose. That's why we feel empty. And here's what the Bible, according to the Bible, this would be a description of what a, a life filled with purpose would look like. Look at that. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another. Deuteronomy 10.19, love the foreigner. In a time when like, uh, societies have become a lot more diverse, we find that the Bible says, love the differences of nationalities and cultures among you. Love them. Interesting. Luke 6.27, what did Jesus say? Love your enemies. Do good to whom? Oh, that's such a hard one. This is one of the toughest verses in the Bible. Did you know that? Do good to people who hate you. Oh my. Lord have mercy. But that's one of the strongest expressions of love that there is. Because true love forgives. True love is, uh, bear, uh, what's that word? Long suffering. And the Bible is saying, when you're doing this, you will sense purpose in your life. Interesting. What else does it say in Proverbs 19, 17? Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. The Lord's talking about helping the poor here. If you pour yourself out for the hungry, 
and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noon's day. You know, it's interesting when it says, when you think of someone gloomy, why, why would you be gloomy? Could be Melbourne's weather, that's one thing. <laughs> but what are other reasons why you could be gloomy? It could be depression, it could be anxiety, it could be stress. It could be because everything this week went wrong for you and that could cause you to be gloomy. Feel down. But God is saying there is an antidote. What is the antidote according to the Bible, according to Isaiah 58? What is the antidote? To do what? Feed the hungry, help the needy, and guess what's going to happen to your sorrows? They are going to disappear. Light's going to come through all that. That seems the terror that you had before. It's going to disappear. The Bible also says, defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and oppressed. Defending good causes, standing up for justice is another way to show love. Does this sound like a meaningful life to you, somebody who lives like this? It is. That's what the Bible puts it for us. What is the theme running through these verses? Can you tell me what is the theme that you can see there? Love. Is there any other word that you would use to describe? Purpose looking out. Could we define it as service? Service, selflessness, love. Kindness. Okay. I will repeat this one more time, my friends. Loving people is a key factor for you to feel complete. If been wondering why you're feeling empty sometimes, here's a key factor. And I'm not talking about loving your child, your parents, your wife, your husband, because that's easy. That's you do by default. We're talking about loving Others, strangers, outcasts, sinners. Here's another question for your group discussion then. We know that we have this call to love and serve, but we don't always love and serve. Why is that? Why is it that even though we know that serving others is necessary, what are the obstacles, our personal obstacles, the cultural obstacles, the structural obstacles in society that make it challenging for us to engage in acts of service? Can you, you don't need to write it down. Can you discuss with your group now, please? What keeps us from loving like we should? Please share with your group. All right. Okay, can I quickly hear, let me hear from the group here in the middle. Tell me one thing that's a barrier for individuals, for people. Fear of being judged. Thank you, that's a big one. Group back there, one thing that's a barrier. Robin and Guada, one thing. Experience? Lack uh, past of ex past bad experience, ah, judgment as well. Ah, interesting. Pride. Pride. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow, you already hit us on the face. That's true. <laughs> what about this group here? Yeah. Fear. Fear of rejection, maybe. Do you know any barrier back there? Did you go to group discuss? Career, busyness, being busy to achieve your own goals, your time. Yeah. Do you guys want to mention one? Selfishness. Mm, what about, that's another big one. Hey. What about this group? Misunderstandings. Like, for example. So it may be similar to a fear of being 
rejected or fear of being judged. Oh, do you guys see the same things running through again? Interesting. Thank you for sharing. Friends, I want to share with you, for example, uh, some one example of somebody who used to have fear of being judged, misunderstood, didn't have time. And this person told me that uh, it's a lady that she and her family wanted to do something. She didn't know what. So what she started doing, she decided that she was going to take one evening in the week and prepare a meal, a dinner, and invite people to have the dinner with her and her family. She decided to start with the church and then outsiders. And she started inviting three, four, or five people together to come together. And she especially was saying, and I asked, why are you doing this? And she said, well, because I identified that one of the needs, what's one of the social needs in our community? Lack of friends, uh, loneliness. So she said, I want people to feel noticed. That was the reason. I want people to feel noticed. And she started inviting people to eat at her place, people that didn't have a lot of friends or in the church or that nobody would invite for lunch, nothing. She would bring them to her house with her family. And she's still doing it. And this person lives in Melbourne. She also invites friends she meets at work. Again, not for a religious purpose, but for love. And guess what? This last Thursday, this person rang me and said, Pastor, do you want to come and join the dinner? Because I'm inviting such and such person. And I had a, we had a board meeting. I couldn't go. But I just think nobody told her to do this. The church didn't ask her to do it. But she found a way. We can overcome the barriers that we fear. That's just one example I know of the many quiet ministries that many of you carry out. We were talking in this group here, and one of them mentioned, oh, there's a brother that goes and distributes food every week, him and his wife, to people. The other sister said, I didn't know you did that. That's why. What, do you know why? Because in the church, there are quiet ministries. And quiet ministries are the most powerful ministries. I know that there's people here who volunteer in op shops. I know of people who distribute food hampers, even pay the bills of some that they find financially struggling. We have people here who show extra care and time for their patients when they're looking after them in the hospital or nursing home. There are people here who bake goods to give away or who sew put together little toys for kids. There are people here who invite strangers to church service. There are people who give Bible studies. These quiet ministries is what the Lord has expected us to do. How many hands have you got in your hands? <laughs> in your hands. How many hands have you got in your arms? Two. I need to ask because some people don't have the two, right? But if everybody here has two hands... I can use this as a symbol, as an example, an, allegory, allegory, uh, as, uh, an, an example of something. One hand you have is to receive, but the other hand you have, so you can give. God has designed us that way. So we shouldn't wait on everyone else to help us move forward. Do you know when people should wait? The time of waiting was way back in the disciples when, with the early disciples when Jesus said to them, wait in Jerusalem until I tell you to go. And then when I tell you to go, I'll fill you with power so you can go to the whole world and help people. So our instructions are very clear. We need to go. I want to tell you, my dear friend, don't, you don't need to wait until you are good enough. Until you are enough. Until you believe people will accept you. Go as you are. Because there will always be someone who will receive you. Don't stay and wait to be appointed. 
Jesus said these words, all authority has been given to you. And this, this is where we come to a key point. We need to have a common goal, my dear friends. In 1 Corinthians 12, 5 to 6, it says, There are different kinds of services, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. I will repeat this message, my dear friend. Whether you're new here or you've been here a long time, your experience as a Christian your life's meaning will not be complete until you're able to live a loving, uh, to live a life of loving service. Oh, pastor, but I am um, retired. I'm a pensioner. I can't go out. I believe the Lord still has something for you because if there wasn't, you couldn't live a life of meaning. Love is the meaning of life. And the Bible tells us that the church is like a body. The church is like a body and uh, we all have goals and we do different things, but all with the same purpose. You know, the nose does something completely different to the knee, thank God, because imagine if we had to use our noses on the ground. The eyelashes are not worried about what the kidneys are doing. And it doesn't matter. Because they're all functioning where they need to function. So that the body can grow healthy. I don't need to know everything that you're up to. You don't need to know everything that I am up to. As long as we all agree on the ultimate goal. To fulfill our purpose. So how, what can you do as individuals? Can you tell your group now, what can you do as individuals? Think of the needs that you wrote at the beginning. Can we each propose one actional step, just one each person, that we can personally do this week or over the next month to address a need on your list? Can you tell your group, what is one thing that you could do to address a need on your list. Be specific about you now as individual. All right, share with your group. Like for example, if you say prayer, I want you to be more specific how you're going to do it. Because it's easy for us to say prayer. But I want to know, you're going to ring someone? You're going to pray with that person? Because remember, if you just pray by yourself, that's not an act of love. It's only if you're praying with the person that becomes an act of love. Do you understand me? So please talk about it. All right. We're now getting to the end. You know, I want to especially say to my friends who are maybe new to the church or new to the journey in, in growing and knowing the, the Bible and understanding like, you may not know everything theologically, explain everything. But I want you to know this. Christ, again, God reveals himself through love. And that's the greatest theological language that there is. And you continue learning, continue studying the Bible, but couple that, join that with service. And your understanding of God will be as strongest as ever. I hope while you were sharing, you came to the realization that individually you may be able to do something and start something that will be helpful. I want to tell you a story that happened in November 1987. Anyone was born in 1987? In 1987? 87? I was born in 86, so... <laughs> Okay, you may remember this. In this particular night, in the main hall of King's Cross Station in London. It was overloaded with passengers rushing to, to and fro, and it's prohibited to smoke in, that, in the stations in the underground. 
but somebody broke the rule and when they lit the cigarette this person dropped the um, match on the ground and it went through the what do you call the elevators not the es escalators and the escalators of that specific station were made of wood they were wooden old wooden escalators and the, the the hand rail was made of rubber and there were probably thick uh, 20 layers of painting on those walls year after year they were painting really thick layer of painting well that small cigarette match that hit the ground continue burning and one concerned commuter approached a man named Philip Brickle he was a ticket collector and he notified him that there's a burning tea bottom of the escalators please come and see and the man Philip Brickle went and saw it and he just put it out but he didn't check what could be the cause of this he thought oh people are making me waste my time I'm a ticket collector I don't want to, I need to go back. They asked me to not leave my booth so they can increase the sales. So I'm not going to check this. He went back to his place. 15 minutes later, a passenger told another employee about a, about a wisp of smoke. He's, he was going up the Piccadilly escal uh, escalator. His, man, his name was Hayes. He was a safety inspector. He went to investigate. And some other commuters saw a bit of smoke, a bit of fire, and they told a policeman as well. And when Hayes went to check, yeah, he saw some smoke, but he didn't call the fire brigade because he thought, this is not major. So he went to check the sprinkler system. But he had never been trained to use the sprinkler system because that belonged to another department. It wasn't his job. It wasn't no job I was working with him, so couldn't use it. By this time, Hayes was nearly, was nearly overcome by the thick, acrid smoke. The fire was getting too big to extinguish. At this time, thankfully, he decided to contact headquarters. He went up to a place where his radio was working, and finally, he was able to tell a fire brigade that there was a small fire at King's Cross, a very small fire. Reyes went back and he gave orders to stop the train, and he told people to evacuate. And uh, the entry of a Piccadilly escalator was roped off and people were diverted to a different stairway. But in the ticking, in the ticking hall, thick black smoke started to snake across the ceiling and the escalator's rubber handles began to burn and melt. There was a strong smell, there was... It, it blocked the escalator, commuters started to begin, began to panic and the fire was spreading at an alarming rate and by and the trains were still arriving the paint in the ceiling caught on fire absorbing the warmth that each new train arrived it pushed a fresh gust of oxygen into the station strengthening the fire and people would go out and walk out and realize that there was the fire in that ticketing hall and near the escalators and they would try to go back into the train but the doors would be closed and they wouldn't open again and the trains would depart and the people were starting to get desperate despite their screaming the train set off again leaving commu commuters behind to face their doom shortly after a train went through, feeding the raging fire, causing a jet of flames to shoot out of the escalator, filling the ticket hall with thick black smoke and intense heat, killing most of the people in the ticket hall.
Within half a second, the temperature of the hall shot up to 150 degrees. By this stage, around 700 people were trapped underground trying to escape, running onto the train lines. It took six hours to extinguish the flames. And it only took longer because the station's blueprints were in a locked office where no one had access with the keys. On that day in 1987, 31 people were killed and more than a hundred were injured. All those lives could have been saved if one person had taken immediate action. But they waited on someone else. They said, this is someone else's job. Somebody else can do this. I want to tell you, my friends, as the pastor of the Frankston Church, we are giving you the keys. We're not locking the keys to only certain specific capable people. You don't, you don't need to depend on our, the pastor's permission, the board permission to, to serve in your community. God has given you the keys. He made you in His image. You are empowered to love like Christ. Every one of you, you are a minister. Can you look into each other's eyes now and can you see? You are a minister. Can you say to the person in front of you, you are a minister of God. You are a minister of God. It's not just the man up there, the front of the woman, wearing the tie or whatever, that's the minister. You are a minister of the Lord. Go, love people, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the Lord said, I have raised you up. I planned you. I brought you into this world for this very purpose so that I might show you my power and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God wants His love to be known and it is your life's purpose to make Him known. I could preach a deep theological sermon this morning. But as Corinthians 13 says, even if you speak all the languages and you have all the knowledge of the world, if you don't have love, you have nothing. My dear friends, Brother Paul, did you know it uh, really impressed me that you keep talking about these homeless people here in Frankston? If you are bothered by that, that's a good sign. If you are bothered that you have a friend who doesn't want to hear about Jesus, but you know this person needs Jesus, that's a good sign because you're feeling... I want this person to have the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit calling you to live out the purpose of your life. Would you like to live a life purpose-driven of significance? So I want you today to ask God to help you live that life. Don't wait for the right time. Don't wait to have enough support. Don't wait to, for people to accept you. Don't wait for the right people. How can you start putting love into action from now on? With that in mind, can I pray for you? Shall we? Can you please bow your heads? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, because in the scriptures, you made it very clear to us what this is all about. It's love. Thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you, Jesus, for reminding us that the greatest of the commandments are, all the commandments are summarized in this. 
They will love you and they will love others. That will make us feel complete. I know that there's many of us who walked into just this church today hungry for a word of encouragement. And we want to thank you because you are telling this person that they are meaningful to you. That they have a mission. This person can do great things with one act of love. We ask for your help. Help us, motivate us, help us overcome the barriers that we mentioned. Help us to meet the needs of our community. Thank you so much, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.